Which of these three short arguments would convince you to adopt water reuse? We have all the technology in the world. We can treat wastewater to the purest of all water sources. H2O is H2O, right? There's a finite quantity of water on Earth, which means that statistically, every drop of water has been through a dinosaur at some point. So if you can stand that your super expensive bottled water has been peed by a triceratops at some point, why does it matter that your tap water has been peed by your neighbor Bob instead? We're missing 40% of the water needed to strike a balance by 2050. We need our water to come from somewhere if we want to survive, and the cheapest and most reliable of all the unconventional water sources is no debate, wastewater reuse. Which one is the best? Tell me in the comments, I'd be curious to have your input. Ooh, this is hard. To pick one? But the answer probably is none of them. To back up that pretty bold claim, I need to tell you the story of the failed water reuse project of the city of Toowoomba. Right, okay, let's go. Toowoomba sits 100 kilometers west of Brisbane, is home to 95,000 people, and boasts itself to be Queensland's garden city, for instance by hosting an annual carnival of flowers. In the heart of Australia's millennium drought, the city's water reserves rapidly declined, so they reacted in 2005 by proposing an advanced water treatment plant to provide provide potable quality recycled water for the town. Almost immediately, the Citizens Against Drinking Sewage Group, you can't make that up, <laughs> formed a local branch and by February 2006, 10,000 people had signed their petition against the Potable Recycled Water Initiative. I'm a citizen against drinking sewage. <laughs> In doing so, they won the first mover advantage and became the benchmark information source for the project. In March 2006, the federal government announced the question of building or not building the plant would be decided in a referendum, also mentioning they'd commit 22.9 million Australian dollars towards the project if the yes was to win. Actually, the tenure of the referendum itself, which is absolutely not common in such a case, is attributed to the vocal opposition to the project. As a consequence, the city council had now 10 weeks to convince people to adopt the project when they had outlined a three-year plan to win public opinion in the first place. In doing so, and as I just said, they were also late to the party as CADS was already rallying for six months. But let's look at both sides' arguments. What the two Woomba city council pushed forward was that, first, many around the world already reuse water, notably the US, Singapore and Namibia. Second, the six-star recycled water treatment would far exceed the Australian drinking water guidelines. And third, doctors confirmed that the seven barriers approach they intended to follow is safe. Doctors approved. On the other side, CADS and its partners were distributing newspapers and flooding internet blogs with their key arguments being Number one, Toowoomba's image would be altered and known as Shit City or Poowoomba. Second, Toowoomba would see a decrease in tourism and economic attractivity with the example of an ice cream factory in the city that claimed it would not be able to market its products anymore. And third, residents had health concerns disliked that the city didn't claim the water to be 100% safe and felt like lab rats. This was exacerbated by the fact that the plan was to have 25% recycled water in tap water, which is very high by international standards. On the 29th of July 2006, 62% of two Wombans rejected the Water Futures project, which hence was abandoned. Ironically, in July 2008, two Wumba announced the building of a pipeline to connect one of Brisbane's water reservoirs and their own reserves to future-proof their water resource. The irony is that Brisbane recycles its wastewater to fill that reservoir so that, technically, two Wumba will participate in a reuse scheme, just not theirs, Brisbane's one instead. Congratulations, you played yourself. And the irony on the irony is that that pipeline project cost 187 million Australian dollars, so over four times more out of pocket for two Woomba for arguably the same result. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> funny, poor Australians, but why should you care? Well, simply because such a mishap could occur to you almost any time. And when two-thirds of humanity experiences water shortages at least one month per year, who can afford to discard water reuse? And that's just for water scarcity because reuse also comes with environmental improvements as you decrease your polluted water discharge, 
positive impacts on agriculture and groundwater recharge, plus the wealth of welcome side effects that come with resource recovery. I'll skim over that today because I've dedicated a TED talk to it, but the bottom line is, we're too water short to neglect water reuse as a resource, and we're too cash short as well to neglect the potent economic advantages that come with it. Objectively speaking, water reuse should be a no-brainer, yet as we've just seen with Toowoomba, but also with many more examples, it is not that straightforward. So how can we prevent rejection from happening again and again? What best practices can every water professional put in place to win the public's acceptance? Here are three lines of advice. By the way, those apply beyond water reuse. Slow adoption of water technologies and solutions is a problem across the board, so I'm pretty convinced that the following can be helpful in those extended cases as well. Number one, draw a box. Ching Liang is the vice provost of the National University of Singapore, and throughout her academic work at the Institute of Water Policy, she has strived to make sense of apparently paradoxical behavior when it comes to water. When investigating the mishap in Toowoomba, she compared the sequence of events in Australia to the way water reuse was adopted in Singapore. For that, she looked into the media coverage of reuse and classified the tone and arguments used by drawing a square with four boxes inside. Rhetoric content that's emotional and hostile to reuse, discursive content that's still hostile but on rational ground, rally around the flag that's emotional and supportive of reuse, the kind of rhetoric you usually see in war scenarios, and finally pro-policy, content that's supportive of the policy as well, but on rational ground. By reading The Australian, The Courier Mail, The Sydney Morning Herald, The Age and The West Australian, Leong found 202 articles that dealt with reuse. She compared those with 223 articles in Singapore's The Straight Times, The New Paper and The Business Times, and the differences between both samples are pretty straightforward. Australian news printed 34% of negative stories, against only 0.4% in Singapore. 59% of Australian papers appealed to emotional elements, against just 15% in Singapore. So if we place that news coverage on the boxes we previously defined, Australia would be in box 1, slightly overlapping with box 2, while Singapore would be in box 4. Interestingly, very few articles in both countries refer to the public's opinion, respectively 5 and 1%. My understanding of that is that media forged the people's sentiments more than people's feelings shaped the way media covered the matter. So what we learn here is that for a reuse project to win the herd, you need opinion relays to rally in your favor. But wait, the press and media are independent in democracy. You can't hold their pen and decide what they write. True? Yet you can approach that cleverly. Journalists, we have a special jail for journalists. Right to jail, right away. I'm sure we can come up with a better solution. First, it's almost impossible to argue against emotion. It's the old saying that someone convinced against their will is still of the same opinion. So you need the opposition debate to transfer from box one to box two and let them deploy the rational for their reluctance. Then only you can argue argument to argument and hopefully bring it home. Easier said than done, right? I hear you, you still can't force journalists to believe what you want. Believe it or not, jail, right to jail. No. But you can offer to take them on tour, which is what Singapore authorities did. If you look at Singapore and their water recycling system, they came and saw what was happening in Orange County and they, they realized that they could adapt that. And instead of putting water in groundwater reservoirs, they could pump the treated water to their surface reservoirs and send it to their, their industry. And so, it took off from there and now it's spreading around the world. When Singapore's water utility PUB conducted these visits to Orange County, but also Scottsdale in Arizona, they did so together with media representatives. They also provided examples of indirect potable reuse as done in Europe for centuries, with many cities living around the same rivers. And as a last part of drawing boxes and acting upon them, they engaged in marketing actions such as bottling their reused water and drinking it openly, but also picking the right terms to describe it. Something that's so important that it's actually my number two. Choose your wording wisely. From the get-go, Singapore cleverly bended the narrative by introducing new terms. All of a sudden, it wasn't treated wastewater anymore, but reclaimed water. And it wasn't reused water at all, but new water. Supporters of the Toowoomba reuse scheme didn't bother picking their words. 
politicians supporting the project suggested the habitants would be drinking human waste. True story? As crazy as it sounds, that's where the title of this video comes from. Here are two more examples. Surely we have to accept that we have to drink our own excrement. <sighs> Despite concerns about gender bending from chemicals in water, there is no evidence of that being associated with what people are drinking. Thanks for suggesting a fear I didn't have. The adjectives used to qualify the project are revealing as well. While in Singapore, the three most common ones in articles were cheap or variations such as cost less, purified and tried and tested, or its variations such as not new, track record or used in other countries. In Australia, the top adjectives used were treated effluent, sheet water and toilet to tap. That last one is probably the most infamous and for reasons beyond my understanding, it keeps getting used regularly everywhere around the world. Yet we know that since its inception, that's a death kiss for projects. What really made me famous was back in the mid 90s, early 90s, San Diego was working on a project to make sewage into drinking water. Now there are a few projects around the world that have been completed, but at that point in time, that was not a very popular thing to even think about. I think it was one of the newspapers coined the term toilet to tap. So, the so famous the, one. Very famous and it stuck. And that, from a PR perspective, that was a little bit hard to overcome. What Paul Gagliardo experienced first and in San Diego in the 90s should wash out according to Austin Alexander. People are seeing the challenge, the climate change challenges we're facing and it's becoming so real that the political will to utilize reuse is overcoming what previous kind of misnomers about reuse may have challenged in the past. So you're saying we overcame the toilet to tap? I think we're getting there. Okay. That's my personal sense is it feels like in more and more conversations, even with people not in the water sector, that openness to reuse is becoming better. Yet, as much as I'd like to share her enthusiasm, the toilet-to-tap horror seems to persist. If we look at Google Trends over the past 15 years, toilet-to-tap has been continuously rising, successively surpassing wastewater reuse, new water, and coming extremely close to reclaimed water. So, vocabulary matters, yet we may still all use the wrong terms to efficiently qualify reused water. A research team at the University of Delaware led a series of experiments on 21 ways to qualify reused water, measuring people's favorability and willingness to drink and pay for that water, depending on its given name. Funnily, the worst of all terms seems to be the one I just used, reused water. Interestingly as well, Five of the six least favorable names were the terms we're using the most. Recycled, reclaimed, non-traditional, treated wastewater and the worst in class, reused, which I've intensively used since the beginning of this video. And even if reclaimed gets ranked 22% better than reused, confirming Singapore's intuition it was a better word, it's still the fifth worst out of 21. Even new water only gets ranked in the ranking soft underbelly, 12th out of 21. So what terms would bear higher public acceptance? According to the study, we should use pure, all natural, 100% fresh, all fresh, eco-friendly and advanced purified. If those terms sound familiar, it's pretty normal. These words predominantly invoke the physical characteristics of the water, pure, fresh, natural, rather than the processes used, recycled, reclaimed, treated, reused, which is a practice that's typically used to market bottled water. Hey, hey. Its natural sparkle is more delicate than any made by man. When zooming in on the preferred terms and checking out if people would like them regardless of if they would also drink the water or not, the two best picks emerged as pure and advanced purified. So if you now subjectively ask me to put some icing on the study's cake, I tend to think that advanced purified ticks all the boxes, as the engineer in me is happy with the descriptive aspect of the terms that gives a hint at how the water is obtained while keeping the pure power word inside. In summary, 
Mind the way you call your water and ensure to bring the right adjectives to round it up. But calling your water advanced purified and taking the journalist to Namibia, Singapore or California still won't guarantee your plan's success if you forget the following third pillar. Go step by step. Two Wumba officials demanded partially for reasons outside of their control, that the inhabitants embraced a rise from 0 to 25% of reused water in their mix, all within 10 weeks and with a group campaigning against it for 6 months. The outcome was, in my humble opinion, very predictable. Water crises are times when you can bend someone's beliefs. That's something we know again from sales theory. But there's a limit to how much you can bend it at once. When Singapore introduced water reuse, it was first for about one person of its water needs and for industrial users, but with a plan to raise it to 50% by 2060. That was a way to get people gradually on board, showing them the already known reuse technology would work in their specific geography and proving its reliability over time. Two best practices here. First, start with the industrial folks. As we're thinking about how we talk to other companies, we're coming at it as a sustainability conversation because we are seeing genuine investments from some of the largest companies in the world into their water and sustainability overall, but water in particular. And especially for those companies that are high water use industries, they're realizing, oh crap, my business can't survive with where projections are going. For water. It is not only not just a nice to have, it's a must have. And second, gradually grow from there. Step by step. The next element of step by step is to give in on human psychology. If you really pipe your water from toilet to tap, regardless of the complex water treatment you place in the middle, it indeed is treated wastewater that you're drinking in the end. But if now, in the middle of that route, you let your water take the sun outside for hours to days in a pond, people might hone in and accept that's just water after all. Sounds trivial, yet that's exactly what Singapore and Vinhook do with open air reservoirs or what Orange County does with groundwater reservoirs. Sometimes we have to put our engineering over objective brains aside and give in to subjectivity. Another best practice is to act with that new water source exactly like I'm doing with Potty for my toddler. I've placed it in his sight yet I'm not forcing his interaction with it. You can do that by having your politicians drink that water in public, by bottling and distributing it, and it doesn't have to be water, you can use it to brew a cool beer, drink responsibly, and cheers. Lastly, and according to Ku Teng Xie, chief executive at Singapore's PUB, the most of your communication should be on the treatment process itself. Neither on the source, nor on the outcome. Singapore does that with a wealth of marketing material, but also a museum of new water, which is only one of the eight tools Singapore used to gain its independence using water. If you want to find out more about the other ones, check out this video here. And if you liked the one you're currently watching, make sure to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.